What's up everybody? It's been two years since I was down in a hole under my house going through the soil series and now that we've got this huge hole dug out back, I thought what a great opportunity to take a look at the soil, take a look at the roots, take a look at what nature's doing back here, and then also dig into my own lawn and show you what we've accomplished over on that side. So let's go ahead and roll that intro. What's up everybody? Okay, so let's look at the topsoil first. Natural topsoil. What was here, what I scraped away, what I added down when I built my lawn, what I could grab, right? There's not really a whole lot of it here. But this right here is sort of the lifeblood of the planet. Oh. So when I constructed my lawn area, I pulled topsoil out from this hillside. I scraped areas where I could find it, I dragged it down, I placed it in, so I used this naturally occurring stuff right here. It doesn't really look like much when you have a pit dug six feet deep and you can see the bedrock, the granite, and everything that's got, you know, taking place under the soil. But this particular soil here, this little bit of topsoil, and that's really all it is, is a little bit of topsoil, this is where most of the biological activity happens really on planet Earth just in the top five to 10 inches of soil. So let me just give you a couple little facts about the native soil here on this hillside. So there's actually a fair amount of organic matter. This is actually pretty high CEC soil as well. This is clay, uh, even though it doesn't really look like kind of the way it's crumbling and falling away off the hillside. It's very dusty. This is super, super, super fine. Now, if you just take a look at what I'm doing here, just this little bit, We've been without rain for quite some time. There's not been much happening around here. So the ground is super dry. And if this was sort of left like this with this sort of shelf face here, this is what would happen to the soil in rain events, wind, everything else. It would just sort of fall down, move itself down the hill and wash out. The couple of things that this soil has going for it naturally is this soil here is super high in K, high in potassium, like to the extreme to where we don't really need to look at adding that for long periods of time if we're growing grass in this native soil. It also has a really high amount of phosphorus 
and really has a pretty high amount of organic matter. And why is that? This was just natural hillside. Nothing had ever been planted here. Nothing had been stripped away. This sagebrush that was here was super old. Everything was undisturbed. So this soil has just been sitting here. It's been doing its own thing for a long time. But I want to give you a close-up view of what it really looks like and sort of the effort that the plant life has made to both keep the soil intact right here on the hillside and then also what it's done to preserve its own plant life over the last millions and millions of years. I wanted you guys to see the roots in my lawn and how that bluegrass has grown and down and worked its way down through the soil and also the aggregation of that soil over really a short amount of time. Five years has been how long I've been sort of cultivating that soil to go from this into what you saw in those baggies. Um, it, it, it was a bit of a change. So this, like I said, does have high organic matter and What's going to be tested out and shown on the lawn is that that now has more organic matter, but let's kind of look at why this is here. See how easy that flakes away? Let's have John Perry check out these roots. So we had native grasses growing up here, sending roots down through the rock, first through the topsoil. Let's flip some of these rocks out of the way. Get that out. And take a look at these roots growing down through here. The native plant life is just going to absolutely dominate any turf that we've got because of its need to survive and how it has to reproduce and basically make its way through these droughts and whatever else is thrown at it because we're not irrigating this, we're not feeding this, we're not doing anything good with it, so it has to just make it on its own. But if you just look to see how these roots are, we go down through these rocks let me move the camera down towards the bottom and show you this. This whole section has been eroded away by roots. When you take what's happening in here, this rock, because of the transport of everything that's happening in the root zone, the water that's coming down it, the mineralization and the weathering of the rock around it has created kind of a little bit of a soil vein right here. Now, I just kind of want to give you an idea on this. There's roots down here where I'm sitting. I'm gonna get a tape measure out real quick and show you this. From the natural level up above, dead even with where the topsoil is and where the grass was growing up above, 51 inches to that root down there. So this right here is what I really wanted to point out, which I think is vitally important to sort of give you a picture of uh, nature versus machinery. This line here behind me, this was all done by that chisel, that huge hammer that we had up here to try to break down through this rock. Now, you saw how some of this stuff was just breaking off. Most of it wasn't really like that. It just happens that there's this root structure flowing all the way down that's actually broken apart this rock so I can get to it. Immediately to the side here, you can see how smooth this is from having that jackhammer just rip down through it and rip down through it. So there's some very different things happening back here between this like super hard granite bedrock, between some of this other weathered rock, between where the roots have chiseled down and gotten through, but even on some of this, what was just brutal, brutal hard rock, there are roots growing all through this thing. And a couple of other things. One of the few things that I found in here were little imprints from fossils of plants that were up against the rock. You know, things that would have happened in a, a major volcanic eruption. And still, 
I find that when you take a look and go down four feet, five feet in the ground and you're still seeing roots growing, it's pretty phenomenal. And just how it's weathered and attached itself to the rocks, that's pretty damn cool. So this is what I think is just fantastic. And when you get a chance to dig down into the ground and you break through the rock and you see what's happening and you see how nature can just drive down through for survival, crack the rock, break these foundations, mineralize and wither this material, drive water down through it, soften it up, transport those minerals back to the top, wither and die and decay and recycle itself over and over and over to create this topsoil. It's phenomenal. It's just a phenomenal process to watch and it brings a lot of things to mind. Like number one, the difference between me having to crack down this rock with a two-ton hammer versus a root that's been working its way down through it really just there doesn't make a whole lot of sense when you just are trying to conceptualize machinery versus nature. But when you take a look at the soil and it's sitting on this rock, the grass up here grows fine. It's not being taken care of. It's just kind of moving along the way that it's supposed to. Is it turf? No. Is it something that's getting played on? No. Is it something that's getting mowed all the time? No. It's being literally left alone. Nobody's messing with it, fully relying on nature. This soil that's here, isn't going to compact unless it completely dries out but with the way that it works and all of these biological functions are happening it gets back to that looseness on its own there isn't an aerator that has to penetrate this soil in order to make plants grow so that right there is what's really super important about this mechanical activity can crack and move away this rock great it can cause exposure absolutely but will it do what all of this is doing? Not a chance. Roots are going to move down. They are going to track with water. They're going to follow water and the greater water penetration and the more that they can chase, the further that they're going to go. So that's really all that's going to happen here. There are nutrients tied in all of this material and the plants are going to use it. Nature at its finest. When you take a look at the way this whole mechanical aeration thing has come about and why I've chosen to go the route that I have by working to stimulate the soil by driving the roots deeper, by making them chase down further, you get this aerification process naturally. Bing. Why do you need to run an aerator? Number one reason, if you take a look, open up a turf management book uh, from way back. You can go as far as you want to, open it up. Why are we doing aerations? Typically, super poor soils, that's the number one reason. Poor turf management, that's the second reason. So the fallback is, jump on an aerator to fix all of the things that you've done wrong. That's what an aerator is good for. And here's why. Here's why that piece of equipment is important. Bottom line, you're not gonna do anything to change the compaction of the soil. If you go through and core, uh, run a core aerator across the soil, pull it all out, take those cores away, put something else down, some sort of a top dressing, peat moss, manure, whatever it might be, anything you wanna put down there on the ground, that will change. That will cause a change in the soil, but not just pulling plugs. Absolutely not. In fact, if you go into the USDA and you take a look at aeration and soil bulk density, you're going to find out that one thing that they say is do not run machinery across it because it causes more damage. You're also going to find out that if you expose the soil, you cause more damage. So anytime that you actually open up the soil, you're losing, you're not winning, you're not creating any sort of aeration. You're just poking holes and actually causing future problem. So let's talk about the thatch side real quick. There's a lot of people out there that use aerators for thatch reduction. Great, there's a reason for that. Again, poor turf management. If you're building up super high thatch layers, here's all that's happening. Thatch is a binding up of roots. It's not the material that we typically call it where things are piling up from grass clippings. That's not thatch, thatch is actually the rooting material underneath. It's like a bedding material. What happens though, is as you are growing fast grass, pushing grass growth, cutting grass grow, and your, your takedown rate of the soil microbial activity is less then the add-on rate of the turf that you're putting on top of it, you're going to create a bed. And once that happens, you start to kind of lose the ability for the soil to respirate the way that it should. You start to trap water, you start to trap air, you kind of get this sort of dead zone and roots will tend to gravitate up to what they can get. So if you're feeding heavy and the watering isn't getting deep, roots are going to grow towards that area where the dead grass is and now you build a huge thatch layer and that becomes a problem so how does an aerator relieve that the same way we see 
carbon loss out of soil when it's exposed. If you come through with an aerator and you spike through that thatch, you expose atmosphere to an area that wasn't getting it before. Great, okay, so now we have a little bit of air exchange there. Wonderful, but what its job now at that point is to decay and you're losing more matter up into the air. So yes, for a matter of thatch reduction, great. For soil compaction, not a chance. That's really where you're going to get the ben biggest benefit. And honestly, that comes down to poor turf management. If you go into some of the old pro turf management books and you start looking into some of those, that's one of the biggest things that they say. Now there's a reason that you would aerify, say greens for, for instance. They, you really do not want to have any sponginess on that green. And when you're doing a lot of um, high traffic, uh, a lot of watering, a lot of spot watering, a lot of mowing, you know, trying to keep that thing at super low heights, you can build up some extra material that you don't really want. And in those cases, they come in, plug, pull everything off, readdress it all with sand. That is a big change there, and that helps to keep some of that OM down rather than building up and get too spongy, which can be a problem there. For the most part, unless you are feeding too heavy and you are not cutting frequently enough or you're having to wait and you're getting too much material packed down, you shouldn't have such a buildup to where you need to run an aerator for thatch reduction because that's really going to be its biggest, most beneficial space. Unless you can get down into your soil, pull material, get rid of it, re-aggregate with something else, over time, you're going to make a difference. And guess what? You're not going to need to aerate anymore. That's sort of the kicker. If all you're doing is pulling plugs every year and letting it pack back down in, what good are you really doing? Just running a big, huge piece of machinery across to get a result that doesn't last. So that's it. It's something to really take into consideration in the way that you're managing your turf. What can nature do? What can we do to encourage that process? How can we be a little bit different in order to create a more robust soil system, a deeper driving root system, the ability for our grass to chase water, for it to chase nutrients, to use and mineralize what's there and not just be reliant on bags and bags of fertilizer. That's really all I got. Talk to you guys real soon. See ya.